All right, would y'all be quiet? <laughs> All right, I'm glad that we are. Uh, I'm glad that we are, are talkative this morning. That's a sign that people want to be together, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is where we're going to be this morning. 1 Corinthians 3. Pardon my tardiness. Uh, I was trying to pull up my uh, keynote presentation, and I couldn't get my computer to connect to the Wi-Fi to pull it up. So I had to... I had to run up to another part of the building and kind of stand, you know, like the old TV antenna and kind of, you know, get connected so it would work. All right. So the first four verses of chapter three, we have actually already read and discussed. But as just a little bit of a reminder, uh, let's let's talk about this context and how we're rolling into this chapter. So you may remember that on Wednesday night, At the end of chapter 2, Paul was talking about the natural man versus the spiritual man. And that natural man is the one who is fleshly, he's worldly, carnal in his thinking, and things that pertain to eternity, things that pertain to the spirit, just don't appeal to him. But the spiritual man is different. He is of the things that are eternal. He is open to those ideas. He's open to the kinds of things that Paul and the other apostles and Apollos uh, and other Christian teachers of that time, he's open to the things that they are teaching. All right. So with that in mind, look at chapter 3 and verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you. All right. Now he's talking to the church at Corinth now. I could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. The church at Corinth is not where they need to be in their thinking yet. Now, there's a sense in which that's true for all of us, right? Um, Even those of us who have been Christians for 50 years, there's a sense in which we're not where we want to be. Corinth is struggling with division, which finds its source in, as verse 3 says, their carnality, jealousy, and strife. So this is not just, there's this relatively young church filled with new disciples who are just making some of the mistakes that characterize infancy in faith, okay? You see that in other New Testament letters. The Thessalonian letters immediately come to mind. Paul started the church in Thessalonica, and then because of persecution, he was run out of town, it seems, days or weeks after starting this brand new church. (laughs) And they've got lots of questions. There's just things that they're ignorant about. And so Paul writes to them and he gives further instruction. But it seems that the situation is different for Corinth. Relatively speaking, it's still a pretty young church. But there's problems here that are more than just, well, they just don't know any better. It's more than ignorance. There's fleshly, worldly, strife, jealousy. All of that is permeating what's happening here. And so Paul is saying... I can't, I can't talk to you as if you are mature because you're not there yet. You are still infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, verse 2, not solid food, yet you were still not able to receive it. And now you're not able, for you are still fleshly. You've got to change your thinking. You're carnal, you're worldly, and the things of Christ will not appeal to you. They will not make sense to you unless you change your thinking, all right? So that's the backdrop of what is going on here. We've read those verses before uh, in an earlier lesson, but I just wanted to remind you of those things. So Paul then in verse five is gonna ask this question. What then is Apollos and what is Paul? And if we could frame that question another way, I think what Paul is basically saying is, who are your teachers? 
What should you think about those of us who have taught you? You should consider us as servants. Your translation might say ministers. So look at verse 5. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. Your teachers are servants. They are simply people who taught you something that was handed to them, something that was taught to them by God. And Paul is going to say that again in chapter 4 and verse 1. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ. We are servants, he says. And he's going to use in this chapter three images that will talk about the work that these servants do for the Lord and these images will talk about the church for whom they do it. So let's talk about these three images. The first one is in verse 6, he uses the image of planting and gardening. Verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Some teachers, while all of them are servants, some are planters. I planted, Paul says. What does he mean by that? He started the church in Corinth, yeah. He planted the church. We hear people today talk about going around church planting, right? This is where that comes from. And there's nothing wrong with that expression. Um, you're starting a church in a place where there was not one before. That's planting. And just like a person would go out in the garden and plant a seed in the dirt, uh, that is planted, that seed is planted with the expectation of a crop or a harvest. I planted, Apollos watered, meaning what? He kept it going. Yeah, he contributed to the work that Paul had begun. All right. Um, if you've done some gardening, you know that there are, well, even if you haven't done gardening, uh, but especially if you have, you know that there are lots of steps involved in taking a seed and turning it into an edible product. Uh, what are some of the things that must be done? Sunlight. What do you say? Sunlight. All right. You need the sun. What else? I mean, yeah, we can't control that, but we need it, right? What else? What, what else is a part of it? You got to get the weeds out. Okay, what else? Fertilize it. Make sure it's got, you know, the nutrients that it needs in the soil. You've got to get out there with the hoe and scrape and dig and all kinds of steps and hours of activity go into planting a productive garden. All of those steps are what the servants the teachers have done. Some are planting, some are watering. Paul doesn't say this, but we could carry the image a little further. There are some who are fertilizing. There are some who are pulling out the weeds, right? All of these steps can be done by teachers who are servants. But where does the actual growth come from ultimately? It comes from God. So Joe mentioned that it needs a sunlight. Uh, well, who, who provides that? And within that seed itself, who, who made that seed? God did. What's inside that seed? Life. Yeah, there's power inside that seed. Who put that there? God did. So, it, it, yes, there's things that we can do to help the seeds grow if, if we don't get the weeds out and we don't fertilize and we don't tend to the soil and so forth. Well, yeah, it's not going it, to do as well. Uh, but I'm reminded of this parable. Flip over to Mark chapter 4. There's a parable spoken in Mark 4 that ev everybody forgets about because it's, it, it's only here in Mark and it's kind of this, I don't know, it, it's, it's just kind of tucked away. And it's easily forgotten because it's so short. Look at Mark chapter 4 and verse 26. The kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And he goes to bed at night and he gets up by day. And the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself. First the blade, 
head than the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. This, this farmer goes out and he scatters the seed. He goes to bed. The next day he wakes up. The next night he goes to bed. He wakes up, he goes to bed. He wakes up, he goes to bed. And then after a while, he goes back out there and boom, there's stuff popping up out of the ground. And he, the rain and the sun and, and the, the weeding and all of this, but this, this crop keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Eventually it's harvest time. Can he explain it? Can, can you and I explain how a seed does what it does? Not really, right? I mean, we, we, we know what it does, but why? Well, we say, well, because God made it that way. Absolutely. But h- how is it that seeds that are, you know, can go back hundreds and thousands of years, going back to some plant that existed a long time ago, h- how is it that this thing reproduces in this little bitty tiny seed, generation after generation? I'm going to suggest to you only God knows the answer to that because that's how he made it. I can't explain that. And I think that's what this parable in Mark 4 is about. The kingdom of God is like that. It grows and God makes it grow. And there's parts of that that we can't really explain. We can't really make sense of it, but it happens. And we know that it's God making it happen. All right. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians 4. There are many servants Men and, and women may work diligently in teaching others, but ultimately the growth is going to come from God. Notice in verse 8, something important. I think Paul just kind of subtly slips in there. Now, he who plants and he who waters, who's that referring to in, in the context? All right, specifically whom? Paul and Apollos, right? I planted, Apollos watered. He who plants, he who waters. I think that would, we should connect those two ideas. Now, what does Paul say about them in verse 8? They're one. Why is that significant? Because what are the Corinthians doing? They're dividing them. They're splitting them. Well, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos. I'm a follower of Cephas. Paul says, we're on the same team. We're not competitors. We're not working against each other. The one who plants, the one who waters are one. We're united in our purpose. We're united in our message. We have the same goal of teaching God's word. And the one who plants, the one who waters, verse 7, we're nothing. Neither he who plants nor the one who waters is anything. Stop elevating us. Stop putting us up and exalting us. We are nothing. We are just servants whom God gave an opportunity to teach. Don't elevate us. God is to be praised for the growth that he's providing. All right. I want to look at these three images. I said there's three of them. This is the first one. I want to look at all three, and then I want to come back, and let's kind of talk about these and put them together, okay? Okay. So if you have some comments, I'd like you to, I'm going to ask you to hold on to those till we get to the end. The second image he uses, verses 9 through 15, he talks about building and construction. In verse 9, he says, we are God's fellow workers, you are God's fields, that's the planting, the gardening image, and then he calls them God's building in verse 9. God is the master architect the designer of the church, so to speak. I I know it doesn't say that here, but that's God is the mastermind behind all of it. And Paul is the one who had begun the construction. He was the, the project manager, the foreman, so to speak. Okay. now what is the foundation of this church, according to this passage? I'm, I'm hearing the whispers say it. Christ. Yeah, Jesus Christ is the foundation of this church. Verse 11, no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Let's think about the elements of construction, the elements of a building. When you are building a house or you're building an office building, what's the first thing you have to start with? The foundation. That's the first thing you have to start with. There's only one foundation to this church which God designed. Jesus is the founder. He is the blueprint. And so all of our teaching, all of our preaching must be according to what he has said. Then comes materials. 
So you get your foundation done, your, your, your foundation for your house is laid, now you're ready to start framing and you get your framing materials. You get all your lumber and everything. Um, look at verse 12. Now, if any man builds on the foundation, all right, see, that's the next step. We're building on the foundation. What are the materials that Paul mentions in verse 12? Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw. Some of those materials that he mentions in verse 12 are valuable. Gold, precious, I mean, gold, silver, precious stone. Some of them, not very valuable at all. Wood, hay, straw. There was one little piggy who made his house out of straw, right? And the wolf huffed and puffed and he blew the house down, okay? And then there was another one who made it out of wood, sticks, and the wolf came and blew the house down. But the pig who made it out of bricks, right? His house stood. The various materials that are mentioned here are talking about the quality of the work that each teacher does. There are some teachers who build with quality materials, gold, silver, precious stones. The beauty is there, right? Solomon's temple was overlaid with lots of gold and its beauty was astounding. Some teachers build with quality, durable, beautiful materials. Some teachers build with straw and hay and sticks, and it's not very good. So the emphasis to me, it seems to be on the quality of the work that's done. Uh, Tim uh, McCall is a home builder and does renovations and things, and he can speak to this idea of quality, I'm sure, very well. Uh, Tim, are there some people who in, in home building, they go cheap, they cut corners, they do shoddy work because as the contractors will often say, well, it looks good from my house, yeah. right? You hear that on the job site sometimes, right? You know, guys out there working on something doesn't look very good. And he says, well, you know, but from my house, it looks great. Meaning I'm not the one who has to live with this. I don't care if it's bad, bad quality construction. It's not at my house, right? Only the best materials only the best construction is to be used on the church of God. And this is a warning to anybody who would try to build the church with inferior teaching and preaching. Everybody follow that illustration? All right, so you got the foundation, then the materials, and then comes inspection. You build your house, the inspectors have to come out and make sure you did the electrical right and that your plumbing is right and everything is safe and it meets certain minimum standards of safety. Well, there's an inspection that takes place with the building that is done of the church of God as well. Look at verse 13. Each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, that is, he built with quality, durable materials, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, wood, straw, hay, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. All right. The quality work is going to stand God is going to judge how each one has, has taught his message, how each one has preached his message, how that message has been received by the listeners. That's, God's going to judge that as well. God knows our hearts as listeners, but he also knows our hearts as, as speakers. So we may preach well, the gold, the silver, the, the precious stone. We, we may build well, or we might preach poorly, the, the wood, the hay, and the straw. And all of that will be revealed upon inspection time. If we preach well, but people refuse to hear, well, God knows that. We've delivered ourselves and the builder will be delivered. But the listeners who failed to apply, the listeners who failed to take heed, they are going to have an inspection too. So this image of building, what quality of construction is there? All right. See that illustration. 
Well, let's get the third one, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about these ideas. The third illustration is in verses 16 and 17, where Paul talks about the church. Do you not know that you, church at Corinth, you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Paul is going to use this same language in chapter 6 later on. We'll get to that. In chapter 6, he's not talking about the church, the, the local church of Corinth, like he is here, though. He's talking about individuals. Your body is a temple, right? 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. He talks about an individual's body is the temple of God and that this Holy Spirit dwells in you. But here, though, he's, he's talking about the church. Do you not know that you are a temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man, and here's the warning, destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. Think about these former pagans in Corinth who came out of idolatry. They understood the importance of a temple. Right? I mean, this, that's what this is. This was a temple that they worshipped in. And in the first century, there were lots of sinful abuses that came along with temple worship, but at least in its beginning, what was the purpose of temples? Why did you go there? To meet your gods, right? Whether it was the temple of Zeus or the temple of Apollos or Apollo or whatever, not Apollos, Apollo. Um, you went there to meet and commune with your God. And the Israelites understood something about that too, right? They had a temple. The warning to Corinth was anyone who divides and destroys God's temple or his church will himself be destroyed by God. This church is divided. They need to stop it. If you divide and destroy the people of God, God will destroy you. So don't do that. So those are the three images that he uses. All right. So let's talk about a few things, a few thoughts, a couple of questions, really, that I want us to think about. Take these three images that Paul uses, planting, the building, and the temple. And I want you to think about what words, what ideas come to your mind with each one of these. So let's start with the first one. We've done this a little bit already. Planting. What other words come to mind with the image of planting, gardening? Growth. Growth. Good. What else? Harvest. Good. Preaching. Okay. Spreading word. All right. Sp spreading word. Uh, uh, spreading, spreading seed. Okay. Um, nurturing. When you want to buy plants, where do you go to do that? To a nursery where nurturing of seeds and plants is done. All right. That word comes to mind. Um, digging. Cultivating. Hard work. All of those words come to my mind, plus the ones that you said. Now take those words. How do you apply them spiritually to the church, to the work that's done among God's people? How do, the, how do these ideas apply? Tim, you have something you want to say? Well, I want to say that one of the things, not that I'm a, a gardener or anything, but read a lot about gardening. Uh, and one of the things that Tim stayed in the Holiday Inn Express <laughs> last night, yeah. <laughs> have a healthy plant, it is less likely to be infested by uh, things yeah. or disease or Yeah, insects. good. Blight or, yeah. So, having, mm -hmm. so the church, if it's healthy, it's less likely for things to come in and damage. Great. Excellent. All right. Some other applications you can think of all those words about planting. Sarah? A lot of patience. Yeah. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, and, and we see that in the lives of people, right? You know, there, there are some people uh, that maybe it, it takes a little bit longer for the word to grow in their heart. It takes a little bit longer for that to come out and be manifest on the outside. And they all grow and mature at their own pace as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's funny, you know, you put all the kernels in the popcorn bag in the microwave at one time, but they all pop at different times, right? And sometimes people are like that. All right, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and my only emphasis being on preaching and teaching is because that's the emphasis yeah, right. of First Corinthians. But yeah, absolutely. All right, Joe. Uh, pruning. Yes, good. You know, in fact, I think I had that in my notes and I didn't, I didn't say it. Um, all right, d develop that a little bit. You prune it to make it stronger so the offshoots don't take over the nutrients of the main plant. It's okay. Like yeah, great, great. Wayne, did you have your hand up? Great. All right, Dad. The only, way, the only reason I plant is for is for the reward. Okay. So I have something to eat for nothing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Uh, we don't put in all this work just to sit back and a admire, you know, the plants from a distance from an academic perspective, right? We, we're doing it because we want to harvest. Um, yeah, Paul said in, uh, I believe it was 2 Timothy, uh, the, the hardworking farmer must be the first to partake of the crops, right? And, and that's the idea. There's, there's a point to this. All right, Judy? If you have red clay like we do, yeah. you have a lot of soul preparation. Yeah, absolutely. You can put a beautiful plant in that red clay. <laughs> and it won't do anything. That's right. Soil preparation is important. That's good. All right, let's go on to the next one. Um, building. What, um, what words come to your mind with this and, and how do those ideas relate to the church? Jonathan. Great part of this, it's close to what I do partial relates to inspections and I think about that word of quality. He mentions it's revealed at the end. If there's, if there's a description, a major defect, it's, you know, we, I mean, wise man built his house on the rock, right? I mean, it's revealed at the end, but that doesn't mean that it's still not the fact of, hey, if you built your life on premise of a person rather than on God or something, it's still there. And in fact, Paul's doing that in part in this, is that he's pointing this out before you get to that point. It's still obvious, or it may not be obvious, but it's still there. It's still a fact that, hey, you built your life on the wrong foundation or whatever. And it's going to be revealed in the end. But Paul, at the same time, is also pointing this out, hey, you've got problems now, and they're apparent, and you need to address them now, but you've got a quality problem already. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And we, we see that in structures that, that we build today. If, if you have a structure that's built poorly from the very beginning, it may stand for a long time without crumbling. Uh, there, there may come a day a long time from now where there's a big earthquake and the whole thing collapses and we say, oh, well, you know, it wasn't built right. Well, that's true. But if something is built wrong and poorly from the very beginning, it's going to lead to problems in the intermediate, even before the structure falls, right? You might have plumbing problems or, you know, HVAC problems or some kind of structure, you know, your, your drywall's So there's problems being revealed all the way throughout, even, it, even though it hasn't collapsed yet. But there's one day it is going to collapse, right? Because it, it just won't work. All right, Jerry. Cornerstone. Oh, good. Talk about that. The first stone laid, they had to take a lot of patience of getting it flat, square, and parallel. Once they laid it, they'd draw strings from that edge of that stone in all dimensions from there on, went back to that stone. Yeah, yeah, it was the most important piece of the foundation. It's the one that got everything else started. And Jesus Christ is called the cornerstone in the New Testament. That's a good point. Okay, Sarah, then back to Dad. There's a lot of planning that goes along with it, too. Um, you know, from, you have this concept to develop that concept based on principles we know to be true. Right. Whatever. And then you put it down on paper and then you go do it. Like it takes a lot of preparation. So in, in the case of this, we need to be preparing ourselves before we can go out and be a good builder. Good. That's a great point. Okay, Dad, then Caitlin. Um, Christ is the foundation of a spiritual house. So I think Paul is telling the Corinthians the material I'm building with, this gold, this silver, stones, hay, these, this is your heart. And the strength of his house depends on your heart. He's going to finish up by saying, even if my work in you is burned up, I suffer loss, but I'm still saved. Yeah, and that, I have preached to you the truth with full con clear conscience. Yeah, that, that's good. That's good. That, and that's verse 15 that he just mentioned. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Caitlin? 
especially as you know, he was talking about how they're so immature. Like they are just building the framework for what's to come, and the process of getting to the what is the end game for us is like you know, with our children, even just like the the parables and the stories that they learn. That's building the framework to lead to them accepting Jesus and being baptized and understanding the true foundation of what. Good, good. All right. All this is really good. All right. Let's go to the last one. Uh, Let's go to the temple. Um, What words come to your mind when you think about a temple and what takes place in a temple? Hey, Ben, can I mention something about the other two? Yeah, yeah. Uh, One thing I was looking at is obedience. Like, you've got a plant, you've got a water. He is the, you know, the foundation. So we use that foundation. And then another thing, and it might be looking a little too far. But when it's talking about being destroyed with fire, well, the, <clears throat> the earth is going to be destroyed with fire. So mm-hmm. where are we when that happens? Like, you know, spiritually. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Great. All right. Um, temple. What happens in the temple? What words come to your mind? Spiritual. All right. Spiritual things. All right. Good. Good. All right. What else? Okay, beauty. I think of uh, temples and very large structures like that is meant to show the rest of the world, uh, let's just say the results of what we are doing or that we are doing something. Okay, show, all right. Show piece, if you will. There's an important word that Paul mentions in verse uh, 17. The temple of God is holy. All right, you think temple, you think holiness, uh, you think about approaching God, reverence, humility. How do these ideas then apply to the church who is said to be this temple? The church should be holy. It should be set apart. It shouldn't look like the world around it, right? And that some behaviors and things will defile it as in verse 17. All right, great. And this whole book... Uh, particularly chapter 5, which is where we're heading, Um, Paul says, you've got things going on in your church that even pagans don't do. Okay? This is bad. This must be corrected. The temple of God is holy. Okay? The other thing in verse 16 that it says is um, it's God's God's spirit dwells there. Good. So, whether that's the church or us as individuals in reference to the temple, God must dwell there. And, and if we have all these other things going on, the worldly things, he can't. Okay, excellent. Excellent. All right, one other question. Absolutely. <clears throat> I think this is beautiful, too, that he brings the church with those three things, because if you've ever done any biblical theme tracing, especially garden and temple, yeah, you see those, like, all the way at creation and they end in revelation. So you read about gardens and God uses them That's all great. the way through. Absolutely. And then he ties the church in on these two themes that God wants us to be taking note of a temple all the way through the Bible. Yeah. And we end in the temple. Excellent. That's great. So. Re- really good comment. All right. Let's think about this question. We've been talking about the church at Corinth and how they exalted their teachers. How might churches today do that? How, how might churches be guilty of some of these same things, just like the Corinthians were guilty of? All right, Tina's going get, to get the ball rolling. With the big mega churches that you have now that are all over you know, television and everywhere else, it doesn't seem that it's, the, it's God that they're proud of. It's their preacher with his big cars and jet planes and all of that. I've been asking the elders for a private jet (laughs) for five years. And they just, I know, I know. Yeah, where's William? Yeah, William's here now, okay? I mean, if there was ever a time for this wish to come true, I mean, I could have my own private chauffeur. All right, great. What else, Melanie? Especially if you preach it somewhere also. 
and he's so famous and we have him in, in our building and people should come because he's here. Right. Yeah, yeah. That was a much bigger problem decades ago, I think, than it is now. I was not to say it's not a problem now, but it was a really big issue back, a, you know, 50 years ago or so. All right, Joe and then Heather. Uh, the transfer of responsibility. Follow the preacher, do what the preacher says. Responsibility. And your, your responsibility is to spread the word. Okay. Rather than letting just the preacher do it. So all right, all right. Or how about trusting just carte blanche implicitly what the preacher says without actually getting out your own Bible and looking it up for yourself, right? Well, let me go ask my preacher about this, see what he says. All right, well, that's fine, but ultimately it doesn't matter what he says, <laughs> right? Okay, Heather? I think the misuse of the name pastor. Yeah, sure. Where there's only one pastor in a church. Mm, right. And that is the preacher. Right, yeah, yeah. All right, that's good. That's good. Anything else? Okay, a couple things real quick to squeeze in before we end. One has to do with the text. The other has to do with an announcement. Um, Paul summarizes, remember the two errors? They misunderstood the gospel, thinking it was just another form of human wisdom, right? We talked about that. And then the second error, they've exalted the teachers, right? Paul mentions both of those in verses 18 through 23. First error. Don't boast in human wisdom. Let no man deceive himself. 18. If any man among you thinks that he's wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise that they are useless. So then let no one boast in men. You see that transition. All right. First thing, don't boast in human wisdom. That's what they were doing. Then he says, don't boast in men. Verse 21, all things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All things belong to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. I think what he's saying there is stop exalting men. You're being served. Who are your teachers? They're servants. You're being served by me, by Apollos, by Peter. We're here for you. We are here to serve you. Stop exalting us. Exalt Christ and enjoy everything that you have available because of what He has done. Now, administratively, I was wrong in what I said Wednesday night. Construction down here is not beginning this Wednesday, next Wednesday. So, you don't have to move your chairs today. All right? Next Sunday, we'll move our... Ch Craig, we'll move everyone's chairs <laughs> next door. All right. Thanks, everybody.